right, good morning. Good morning, England. Um, my name is Bart. As you can see there, anyone wants to stalk me, then this is me, Andrew Woodworth. That's my Twitter handle. And if you want to pay me large sums of money in exchange for advice, then you can go to my website. Um, this morning is going to be about object-oriented programming. Um, mostly from the perspective of someone who's gone through this whole ordeal of, I don't know what it is, to, yes, I can do it. Um, which means I will not be using textbook terminology. Um, I will try to use terminology that um, is probably appeals to you a lot more than uh, what you've learned in school, because you are all experienced back-end developers, I presume. Uh, experience in Drupal 6, 7, having done a lot of back-end work, but not too much with things like classes and objects. Sort of right? Just kind of assessing the audience here. I know, but you're, you're different. We already talked. Um, is there anyone here from a different kind of background who is not, apart from him, who is not a, a, an experienced backender who comes here with a different? Yes. Just from um, development, but not from Drupal. Okay. So you have done Feast before? Yes. Okay. Object oriented or also just more like? Mostly procedural. Okay, mostly procedural. Okay, so similar background. You? Yes, you too? No? Okay. Well, it's um, it's a good start. Um, there's not going to be that much code in here, just a little bit. Um, but the concepts will definitely help you get on your way when um, starting to do some replay coding, back end coding. Um, this one's on. All right. Um, so, this is basically my definition of what object oriented programming is um, basically, type data. Um, in PHP, you have a couple of basic data types. You've got the scalars, integers, strings. Um, you've got three complex types, which are arrays. Those are basically lists. We have used them a lot. We hashed arrays, which should actually be objects, like a render arrays. You probably use them to build forms, pages, whatever not. Um, there are actual objects. More about that a little later. And then there are resources, things like database connections, uh, file handle, uh, handles. Um, and the objects in PHP, um, the ones we're using in Drupal 7 and below are really just instances of the standard class uh, class, it's called SDP class, um, which is just any basic object without any functionality. You just, it has no methods on it, it has no private properties, it has more about that later what, if you don't know what it means. You just set public properties on it and that's really it. It's basically just an array in an object form. It doesn't do anything. There are a few base classes in PHP. Um, and we don't really use them just yet. Changing in Drupal 8, uh, it's more, in more interesting to make your own classes and your own code. Um, and what you do with this is you create your own data types. Um, because it's fine that the data type is an object, but what kind of an object is it? Um, you can have a building class that defines a building, and the building has a roof property, it has wall properties, it has front door property. Um, it can have a method that says open front door. Um, and a method is nothing more than a function on a class. But you can have subtypes of that, uh, because what kind of a building is it? Is it a house? Is it a flat? Is it a school building? So you can create subclasses. And using that structure, you can create very specific data types. Um, instead of having large, untyped arrays with all kinds of is set calls, like is this property set in this array, which doesn't really mean anything. It's hard to document, because we have a class, so we'll see a little bit of properties on it and methods. You can add doc blocks on there, with type ins. IDEs knows how, you know, how to work with that. Um, it makes programming a lot better uh, to work with a particular variable of a particular type rather than having a large array. Um, some of these things, all of these things I already I mentioned before. So a class is really just a blueprint. Like any architect would write or design a blueprint for a building, their building, and then off that blueprint they can create multiple buildings of that type. They're different, they are not identical to each other even if you look at them identical on a molecular level, there's still two different buildings, two different instances of the blueprint. And that's what we get to, uh, uh, that's what an object is. An object is merely an instance, a manifestation of a particular bl blueprint or a class in um, coding terminology. A property is nothing else than a variable on a class or an object. Um, behaves the same way, it's just on the object. It's not somewhere else. Um, it's not global, it's not, it doesn't only exist within a function, it exists only within that particular object. A method, fancy word for a function, 
on an object, nothing else. Really cool thing about objects is they have state. Um, you can change an object internally, and you can pass on the object, and its internal state, its configuration, will remain the same. And it's, an object's state is really just the sum of the values of all its properties. Um, just like an array changes when you, when you unset a value, add a value, change a value. An object, then its state changes. Then again, an array is merely a symbol list, so we don't really say it has state. But an object has state, and when you set, uh, so like you have an entity object with an ID property, and you create a new object, it has ID null, it's just empty, it's nothing. And then you set an ID on it, its state has changed. And that's a very simple example. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. You can set, like you can use properties internally to store, statically store pre-processed data. We use Drupal static for that in Drupal 7. More about that later. You can do that in the property. So while two objects can be identical in functionality, their states can also be different. Um, and even with the same state, they're still not the same object. Um, what I just said, um, static variables in Drupal 7, um, so that's static variables in functions, um, have been changed, replaced by object properties in Drupal 8. Because the functions that we use these static variables in have been converted to methods on a class, and then we use an instance of the class and an object to do things with it. Um, really cool thing about that is that static properties and functions are pretty much impossible to reset unless you have a bunch of workarounds like Drupal static and Drupal 7. Um, class properties are a lot easier to deal with, for instance, um, like I said, if you have pre-processed data in a property, you want to clear that out because you, um, like a pre-processed list of hooks, like, oh, which modules implement hook, uh, I don't know, um, hook menu. We don't have it in Drupal 8 anymore, just as an example. You enable a new module, you want to clear that pre-processed list because you, that new module might also implement hook menu. You want to rebuild the list. You can just add a method to the hook menu and the class if you have one to clear that internal property. So the next time you call get implementations, it creates the list from scratch. It's a lot more difficult with static properties. Um, so this is more about this whole blueprint thing. Um, people coming from languages like Java will know that basically your class, your abstract class is your blueprint. But PHP goes one step further. An interface defines methods and constants, but it does not provide implementations. It does not provide function or method bodies. And the really cool thing about this, that this <coughs> lets you write um, or specify um, the identity of an object. Um, maybe you have an interface for a, a cache backend. Um, this sounds familiar to you. Um, a cache backend has a set cache item method. It has a get cache item method. It has a clear old caches method. You'll write that in the interface. How that how a particular cache backend would store or get or clear its cache items, you don't care about at that particular point. You just want to specify that any cache backend has this functionality. So you, do, you define what an object of that interface and the instance of that interface must be able to do. And how it does it is completely irrelevant at this particular stage of coding. Another way of explaining this is it's a contract. When you use an object, uh, it's an instance of a class that implements an interface, there's a contractual obligation. This object says, I can do these things. Absolutely sure. No exception. How I do it, that's my job. But I can do these things. Uh, this is an example. The contrast isn't really high. Um, you just use the interface keyword to specify your interface, and you create a function with a name and your parameters, just like you would do in procedural code. However, you'll see a semicolon here instead of curly brackets with an implementation. There's no body. It's illegal in PHP to have a function body in an interface. This is an identifier, a visibility identifier. A little bit more about that in a second. But there's inheritance. Um, something you might know about, um, interfaces can extend interfaces, classes can extend classes, like the house class can extend the building class. The house interface, class, uh, interface can extend the uh, uh, building interface. Um, just like this one adds support for doing multiple things to the interface that only supports doing one thing. This is really cool because you can compose different sets of functionality without having to duplicate your code. 
So where an interface defines what something does, a class defines how objects do it. Um, they implement the interfaces that you wrote before. So it's ideally when you write something, when you design a new piece of code, a module or a component, whatever you want to call it, you start writing your interfaces because that's that defines what your code should do. You'll figure out how to do it later. You start with what should my application do. Once you have those, you start thinking about, okay, we define the functionality that we need. Now let's think about how we're going to do this. We want to cache in the back end. I think the database is a good default cache backend. So you write a class for database caching, which implements the caching interface that we talked about earlier. So the class says, I can do these things. I am, part of my identity is, I'm a cache backend. It can also pretend to be a foo interface, whatever. It can do all these things, as long as the method name's not flash. Um, and these classes can then be instantiated into objects. So an interface is only the beginning. The class can really be used. Here's an example of that. You can see, class keyword. We implement keyword to make sure that the interface is indeed part of what that class does. And here you see that same function, the same name, the same visibility identifier, and the same argument. You can't change the visibility unless there's something more or less restrictive. You can't change the arguments unless there's something less restrictive, unless you have um, optional parameters. Like any function or method can have optional parameters. Um, the reason why you can't change these things is because it implements the interface that says, like, I, I am a foo interface. Anything foo interface can do, I can do. Maybe you can do more than that. So you have optional parameters that you can pass on if you know you're dealing with this particular class. But it must at least be able to do whatever it is that foo interface specifies. And this one does have a function class. Using the new keyword, we create a new instance of that class, an object. Um, and using this little dash and greater than sign notation, we call a, method, a function on that object. Um, just, it's just the one that's specified there. Uh, what did I write? Oh yeah, it says returns hello world because that's what this thing does. <coughs> um, it's a little light in here, so you can't see it very well. Um, this is also a concept that is probably familiar to those who have programmed in other languages before. An abstract class is a partial implementation. So whereas a class must, if it implements an interface, it must provide implementations of all the methods and all the interfaces that the class implements. If it doesn't, it's a syntax error. It's, it's, a syntax, it's, it's at least a fatal error. An abstract class can get away with not providing implementations for all the methods that it has. But the, uh, um, the consequence of that is that you can't directly instantiate a class. You can't uh, create an object of an abstract class. Um, but it's a great building block for providing a base implementation. Um, in Drupal 8, we have a couple of base classes for entities or plugins that do just like the basic administrative Oh yeah, of course, and ID is very simple, it's stored. The ID method returns the ID from the property. It's pretty much the same anywhere. Uh, there's a lot of oil it's scaffolding code that you don't want to have to repeat everywhere. So uh, an abstract class provides these generic implementations for these generic methods that you don't really want to change anyway, but it's also a way to have to retype them for every single class. This is a little bit of an example. Um, there's probably as much code as you'll see today. Um, use the abstract, keyword in front of class, everything else is really the same. Um, but we remember that we had a foo interface, which provides do foo, but the foo multiple interface provides do foo multiple. So this class only provides an implementation for the do foo method, not the do foo multiple method, which makes it abstract. If we drop the keyword here, and we try to parse the file, PHP chokes on it, but you can't do that. Um, however, if we try to do new abstract foo, we also get an error because we're not allowed to create an object of an abstract class. So we create a real class that is not abstract, and that provides the missing little bit of uh, the missing implementation um, because this is really specific. We want this to be absolutely specific to this class. There's no generic base implementation, and then we can instantiate the foo class to an object and work with it. This is something new. This is from PHP 5.3. So if you've worked with PHP 7. Which, uh, Drupal 7, which requires 5.2 at the least. Uh, this may not be something that you're familiar with. Yeah. So, uh, back on the other classes, um, can we do multiple inheritance with PHP? No, no. Oh. That's partly where traits come in. Um, multiple interface inheritance is possible. So, if we go back here, 
what we could do here is after class, blah, blah, implements foo equal to the first, comma, space, and then more interfaces. So we can do multiple interface inheritance, but not multiple class inheritance. That's one of the uh, major differences, sometimes pain points in PHP when you're familiar with something. I think Java does multiple inheritance with RC. Um, so people coming from those languages who are familiar with that, for them, this is a roadblock. However, traits go a little bit of the way towards solving that. Because a trait is nothing more than a set of code, properties, and, and methods that you can reuse elsewhere. It doesn't impl implement interfaces. It's really just a little snippet of code. Um, classes can use traits. It's basically PHP's copy-paste. You define your methods and properties in a trait, and then using use, you state actually, uh, which you can see here, and you include that piece of code into this class. So class foo acts as if the do foo method was part of itself. When you execute this code, um, you can analyze the class to see which interface or which traits it uses. But when using these methods, there is no reason for the code execution to believe that that comes from the foo trait. You'll see it in error handling. Um, slides will be online, by the way. Um, you'll see it in error handling, like, oh, um, invalid argument pass on to the uh, do foo method in foo trait. Um, but for all intents and purposes, for your whatever you're coding, that doesn't really make a difference. Um, and traits are really useful for not that really complex stuff, uh, because that gets messy, but for really simple things, like simple uh, functionality that doesn't require many uh, outside dependencies, uh, basic preprocessing. Um, we use traits, for instance, uh, there's the T method in Drupal 7, or the T function, but we don't really use, we try not to use procedural functions in Drupal 8 anymore, there's still a bunch left, but we've added that to a trace in Drupal 8, also because it comes with the format plural uh, method, same function in Drupal 7, and you don't really want to retype that. And the reason we need that exact, those exact methods on every class is because PUTX needs to extract the user interface strings through those methods. Like it, scan, like, it scans, your, it's like it scans your Drupal 7 code for any usage of the T function, and then it extracted the string as the first argument, um, and added that to the list of translatable strings. It does the same thing with T methods in Drupal 8. So this is one, it's a really, the trait is maybe 20, 25 lines long, including comments and white space, um, but it's something that must be exactly the same and is reusable everywhere. It doesn't contain that much logic, so we put that in a trait. Um, if you want to do really complex logic, like pull in all kinds of service objects and uh, do complex things with them, um, that gets messy because a tray cannot implement an interface. It also, uh, um, it doesn't know um, in which class it is used. So in this particular case, the tray could call the do foo multiple method because it's used in a class that provides it. But here it doesn't know about it. It doesn't know where it's used. So that's one of the limitations of a trait. It can't really look outside itself. It cannot implement an interface. It doesn't know which classes it is used. So um, it only has a, it has access to everything in the classes that it is being used in. But when you're writing a trait, you don't know anything except for its own properties and its own methods, uh, which makes it difficult. Because if you write a trait that is only supposed to be used within a particular type of base class in which a particular method or property is available, it's cool that you have to document that because someone might use your trait elsewhere and then things will fail because that property not available. So trades are cool, but I do advise some caution with using them. Uh, try using them for small, self-contained snippets first to reduce your boilerplate. And um, if you've used them for a long time and your experience with them is run, you'll probably see other situations where they'll be useful. But try to keep it small in the beginning. Any interface can extend any other interface. Any trait in the class can extend any other trait in class. Um, child classes can access methods from the parent class. If you have a house class, it can call methods on the parent building class. Um, and this is the particular notation here. So we have a foo class extended by polite foo. So imagine this is the building class, this is the house class. Um, and we want to reuse some of the base functionality in the parent class. Uh, we're, we're overriding the method, as you can see here. The child class, which, oh, which provides the exact same method as the parent does. So when you instantiate plot foo, you call do foo on it. Nothing.
anything here happens, unless we do here, we explicitly call the method in the parent. So if this function is executed, it calls the parent, then this line is executed, and then it keeps on going here in the execution. Um, if you have tons of code in your parent classes, this might not always be the right thing, but if you want to change a few small things that we do here, um, it is a very, very useful way of reusing your code. Um, what you can also do with this is, is if someone writes a class that you think is really, really useful, but there are a few tiny things missing, like this one, this, this is really impolite, I, which in the Netherlands or in Germany is a perfectly good way of greeting someone, but in any English speaking language it's considered to be extremely rude. So you're like, okay, for my website, I want a more polite way. So what you do is you reuse all of that stuff, but this is like a 2,000 line class, imagine it. You want to reuse it, because it's perfectly fine. You want to change a few tiny things, so you'll extend the class, tell the system to use your class instead of the old class, and you're done. This is something you cannot do in Drupal 7 because you can't overwrite functions, procedural functions. But you can't do all these really cool things with classes. This is a very special snowflake. Um, it's one of the reserved words in PHP, um, and it's a variable that only exists in very specific contexts, namely within any object. Um, and it's a bit of magic, it points to the object itself. So when you are in one function, or in one method, and you want to uh, talk to another method in the same object, you use this, like this. Foo-foo, multiple, wants to get the output of foo-foo in its own object. So it's basically talk to your sibling and figure things out. That's what it does. It uses the, we've seen this notation before. Um, so because this is magic, um, it always refers to that particular object. So instead of having to manually put an object in a variable and then call a method on it, it's always available. We saw a few class methods already that have the public word before function, function, and the argument. It's not something you'll see in procedural code. It is an object-oriented feature only. We saw public. As the name explains, and the list already explains, you can call it from anywhere. If you are, you have an object, you have a method on it that's public, and you are outside that object, so you're not calling this, but you're actually outside the object from another piece of code, any public method can be called. Like any function, there's no side effect. Protected and private methods cannot be called from outside, with one exception that I forgot to add here. Um, Protected methods can be called only from within the class itself, or child classes, or other objects that are instances of the same class. And the reason for that is that if it's an object of an instance of the same class, it knows the, it knows the other objects' internals, because they are two houses of the same blueprint. Um, they know where the other house's front door is, so they can talk directly to the front door in having to, instead of having to go through the public open front door method. That's kind of what it is. Um, it's kind of familiar. Um, you're familiar enough with the other object that you can do things internally. You know, like you know, you know, your brother or your sister's house, you can walk in, you're familiar with them, you know where it is, it's fine. Private methods can only be called from within this, the exact same class. So even if you have a private method in the building class, and you extend it with the house class, the house class can't do anything with the private method. Um, there are reasons for using this. Mostly, um, people are advised to use public or protected only. Um, you can always make something private later, um, but if you use private from the start, you have you potentially limit other developers to use of your method, and that's not really a nice thing to do. We use it very scarcely in core for shit that's like, do not touch this at all. Um, so you, you'll probably hardly ever see it. Uh, there is an example. Um, very nice comment under here that says that we'll get a PHP error when we call the do bar method because it's protected and we're calling it from outside. Um, try this at home. You can do it. Nothing will blow up, but PHP will just be really angry at you. Um, this goes back to what I said in the beginning. Objects have a type. Um, so you have a string. Uh, you're just a string. You're just an integer. It's an object of a type. It's a house with all its functionality on it. Really cool. Whereas in JavaScript, for instance, 
count. You can do like you have a length method on a string because a string is an object. That doesn't that stuff doesn't exist in PHP. It only exists in objects, but that's why they're awesome. Um, you can accept you can check an object's type in two different ways. There's type hinting, um, which is there's my example. Um, this is type hinting. Um, when you pass on a value to the foo parameter when you call the foo method for function here, it, it works for functions too, actually. Um, PHP internally checks if what you're passing on, in this case, is an object, and if it's an object, if it implements this interface. And if it doesn't implement the interface, it gives you a big fat error. And that's really cool, because that's not supposed to happen. It says it accepts a foo interface, so you should pass it on. And when you do pass it on, if you have an IDE like PHP Storm, if you still use Notepad or anything, and you're doing your blade, I really, really recommend upgrading to something a little more powerful because it will make your life a lot easier because there's hundreds of thousands of files and all the class inheritance. It makes navigation easier plus auto-completion. And that's a really cool thing because if you start typing here dollar foo and then dash greater than sign, the proper IDE will give you auto-complete suggestions of all the methods you can call on that object because it knows it implements foo interface. So it will give you the option to autocomplete automatically using tab any of the methods on the foo interface. Makes your coding faster, um, less error prone. And if you do call a method on foo that is not known in foo interface, a good error like PHP storm, well, I don't work for them, I work for these guys, um, will mark that function call, that method call, as a potential error. We'll highlight it tell you something's wrong here. Either you're calling a method that doesn't exist in this object or your type hint is just horribly wrong. Look at it. Um, so that's one type of object type validation, one version of object type validation or checking. The other one is we have instance of here. Um, there are reasons for using one or the other. And you'll, you'll probably figure them out yourself. Um, in this particular case, this function works for any object that includes foo interface, but it has a special case if it also implements foo multiple interface, then do one extra thing. Also, any IDE will automatically do the same auto-completion and um, error checking. If this passes and you do foo, blah, it uh, dash greater than sign, it will give you an auto-complete list of all the methods on foo multiple interface instead of just foo interface. Um, so it doesn't only really make you a faster coder and less error prone, uh, but it's also error checking. Things fail early. If you don't do this type hinting thing, um, something might just fail five function calls later instead of here, while the actual cause of the error was in the call to this method instead of five functions later. Um, it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, the um, possible types that you can use um, are any class or any array uh, interface name uh, or the word array should be an array. In PHP 7, you can also type in on scalars like int and string and bool. Um, it has nothing to do with object oriented programming. It's really cool. It makes your code a lot more serious. Um, one of the things we had in 7 and below was oh, we have all these thousands and thousands of functions, and yeah, we can put them all in one file, but it becomes a big fucking mess. And we don't want PHP to have to parse 100 or 200,000 lines of code even if you only do thousands. Class autoloading or interface autoloading have been possible in PHP for some years now, um, but we never really used it. Um, and that changed when namespaces were introduced in PHP 5.3. Um, and this is part of um, this is a PSR, this is a, a PHP community standard thing. Uh, number four is just an arbitrary number to identify this standard. It's created by the Framework Interoperability Group aka fig, not to be confused with the edible. And this one is an, basically an industry standard. The industry has come together. Um, there are people from all kinds of frameworks and CMSs in that group, working group of people. Uh, Larry Garfield Krell is the representative of Drupal. And they have a bunch of standards. And this one is the autoloading standard. Basically what it does is class names map to file names, dot PHP. PHP. That's one of the requirements of the implementing the standard. Namespaces map to directory. And a namespace is nothing more than um, if you have two classes with the same name and you put them in a different namespace, you can basically 
name, backslash name, backslash whatever you want to do. Um, you can have that. You can load these both class, these classes at the same time, have the same name, but they won't clash because they live in a different namespace. And according to this PSR4 standard, a namespace maps through a directory, which also means that if two classes with the same name live in two different namespaces, they also live in two different directories. And this introduces predictability because when you want that class that's not included yet, the autoloader is triggered, which you know if you use one according that works according to standard, and it roughly knows where to find it. So within a, with a few tries and file reads, it has the client that you need because you can register a couple of different namespace routes and directory routes. Um, it knows where to find it. Has anyone worked with the Drupal 7 registry before or tried to work with the Drupal 7 registry? It does a similar thing. Um, you might have seen it in module info files where um, there's a files array. Um, and that's meant for the registry because when you install module in 7 and it has this array of files in its info file, the registry will scan these files, make an inventory of all the interfaces and classes in there, and put those in a database. And then when your code executes and you need one of these classes or interfaces, it looks up in the database which file that was in and then loads the file. It's really amazing apart from two things. Everything breaks when your database connection breaks, and it's really bloody slow. This predictability um, means that offloading just boils down to file interaction, um, which means it's faster, it's more reliable because you can do that before a Drupal bootstrap, before you bootstrap your database connection. This is an example. Um, I also maintain a payment module, which is why I sometimes throw in an example like this. Um, the Drupal payment namespace root, um, basically we use Drupal backslash and then the machine name of the module. That's how it works for any module. And that maps to the SRC source directory within the module itself. After that, everything maps one to one. Entity maps to entity, payment interface maps to payment interface. And then again, dot PHP for the extension. Um, in this particular case, when I ask for the payment interface in this uh, namespace, there's only one Drupal payment namespace registered, which maps straight there. So within, with one try, the autoloader knows, load this file included, tell PHP, yeah. I found the file, each people use the interface, and you're done. Very fast, um, very painful. Um, we're getting close to the end. So I've been talking a lot, and of course there are benefits to this, which is why you're here. Class, cla that must just be a D. Class objects are faster than arrays. And if you don't trust me, follow that link. I said the slides will be aligned so you can you don't have to write them the number. Um, that's uh, Nikita Popovich. Um, he is um, a 20, 21 year old prodigy who maintains the PHP core. Um, has been um, working on many, many performance improvements in the PHP 5 series and PHP 7. And when he was fed up with people telling him that classes, that objects are slower than arrays, he did the benchmark and explained to the entire world why everybody was wrong. And as of PHP 5.3 or 5.2, Class objects are actually faster than arrays. Only when you work with properties that have been documented, that have been defined. Am I getting close to my time of it? Oh, okay, we're almost done. Um, but only if you define all your properties in your class beforehand. If you start working with dynamic properties, then it's slower than an array. So as long as you document, you shouldn't be working with dynamic properties. So as long as you do this properly, it'll be way faster. Just tell anyone who tells you Interfaces and classes are documentation because they're, 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 they're self-contained uh, pieces of functionality with their own documentation blocks. Like any function in Drupal 7 should have a documentation block that says this function does this. It takes these parameters, it gives you these return values, it throws you these excep exceptions, etc. That is the same thing with class and interface. But then it's all grouped together. Um, it's very self-contained. But if you have, um, we use a lot of small interfaces to compose one larger object, like an entity in Drupal, uh, it implements a ton of different interfaces. It's an entity interface, which has identification methods, like, oh, what's your entity type? What's your ID? Um, it does a lot more. Plugins, um, I'll be talking about that this afternoon. It's really cool, actually, if you want to extend Drupal 8 more. Um, have a basic plugin inspection interface. It's like, oh, what's your ID? What's your definition? But there's a plugin form interface, in case the plugin also wants to provide a form. It has um, a configurable plugin interface in case the plugin provides exportable and importable configuration. 
and you combine all these together to one large object. If you keep the individual pieces separate, so if you want to do something with the configuration functionality, it's its own piece. You can rip it out, you can rename it, whatever the hell you want, and the actual class will remain largely untouched. As I already said, especially with the type hinting stuff, um, and if your doc blocks are good, like the at parents and the at bar, at bars and returns, your IDE will make you a faster and um, better developer because um, you get all this auto-completion, you don't have to look up all the order of all the parameters anymore because it just knows what you're trying to use and can give you the, the hints right as you code in line. Um, well, I already said this. It makes you a goddamn better developer. That's why you need to do this. Um, if your boss tells you otherwise, this is really what makes you a better Drupal 8 developer. Not even a Drupal 8 developer. This is the stuff that the PHP community has been using for several years now. Um, like I said, these PSR standards, this is just one of them. They all follow these approaches. Um, so if you do this, you won't only be able to write proper Drupal 8 extensions or override existing behavior, but if need be, you can write your own custom symmetry app for a client if you need to do some backend processing which Drupal is too heavy or it's not suitable because it's a team method and a few other things. Um, gives you better job opportunities um, because if you're fed up with Drupal, please do have a symphony job for um, You'll don't do this just yet because it's going to be on there soon. Um, you can find the presentation here at slideshare.net slash Bart Feinstra, which is my full name. Uh, again, this is me where you can find me. Any questions? Yeah, one, minute. one minute. Yes. Um, if, oh, if an object is copied, do I have um, another assembly class of the object, or do I have two references to the same object? Very good question. Um, as you may know, when you pass on parameters to uh, function or method calls in PHP, um, for instance, an array, with a, it's a very complex piece of data, it gets copied into the next function. Um, unless you use the ampersand in the function parameter, then it becomes a reference. Every object is always a reference in PHP unless you clone it. That's the word clone, space, and then the name of the variable. Then you create an identical copy of that object, but it's a different object. So by default, and this has been like the case for, for many versions of PHP, every object is automatically a reference. That was it. Thank you for coming. Um, good luck with this. Um, if you're planning on sprinting this weekend, this is very valuable information. Um, I do recommend that you spend a few hours in the sprinting session. Have fun. See you at the social tonight. Thank you.